。好，然后我接下来就是被交付的任务，就是来介绍我们今天的 Keynote 出场。非常感谢 Ethan 愿意来哦，因为他其实不太不太实体出现在。在远方的那我们这次，因为上次有那个有人有有有社群的朋友 T T K， 他在 Poland 有不遇到有听到他的演讲，但是是 remote， 好，所以我们我们这非常荣幸，就是请邀邀请到 Ethan， 我稍微哎、欸、可以切换回回给我哦，那我们就是呃有有三件事情 ，Gov Zero 跟呃 Ethan 有有一个共同点，我很快的讲过，然后我们就请他上来。好，我们最近得到了这个 Ars Electronica Digital Community Award of Extinction。好，但是我们发现十年前 Global Voice you got the same award。那我们是这样在今年得到的，我们就觉得这是一个前辈，这是一个一个一个传承。<笑>好 ，Another thing is you're from MIT Center of Civic Tech Media. We are from Um, MIT, <laughs> made in Taiwan. We are very grassroots. Ah, then is yeah. We are MIT, MIT, MIT. Hands up. Yay! Yeah. 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 Yeah.
what does it mean to be a good citizen in a democracy? And I think a lot of the time when we're asked this question, we think the good citizen is the one there on your left. She's very quietly going to the polls. She's casting her vote. I notice in the photo it's mostly older people. It's mostly older people who end up voting. But I actually think the good citizen might be the one on the other side. Uh, and it's the young people. And during the Sunflower Movement, they're coming to the downtown of Taipei. They're occupying, they're demanding real change. And I want to make the case that to have a healthy democracy, we need both kinds of citizens. We need the people who are supporting the institutions, and we need the people who are working to tell us when those institutions don't work anymore and they need to be changed. So there's good news. What it means to be a good citizen changes all the time. Early on in America's history, to be a good citizen meant that you would look for whoever was the most prominent, the most wealthy person in society, and you would elect him to go and represent you. It wasn't until maybe 200 years later that this whole idea of being an educated citizen, of reading the newspaper, of checking out to find the better political candidate, that doesn't come up until about 1920. It's actually a fairly new idea in politics. And I think we might be heading to a moment where there are some very new ideas coming up, and I think some of them are coming up even from places like Taiwan. So here are two words that I try to use to explain this. And they are institutionalist and insurrectionist. And here's the way to think about them. Institutionalists think that the way that we make progress is by working through our existing strong institutions. Institutionalists want to elect people to parliament. They want to win voting contests. They want to work within the structures that we already have. Insurrectionists look at those structures and say, I think those structures might be broken. And I think maybe it's not to my advantage to work within them. Maybe what I need to do in some cases is think about how we build better structures. Maybe we build something completely new. Maybe we build no structure at all and try to figure out a new way of running things, but something very different from what we have today. Now, one of the things is that you can be on any side of the political spectrum and be either an institutionalist or an insurrectionist. My country is going through a very weird moment right now. We elected a, a madman, frankly, and he is probably best understood as a right-wing insurrectionist. He has very little regard or respect for any of the existing institutions. He wants to tear them down, and he wants to tear them down because he wants a particular vision of white male supremacy in the United States. And it's a disgusting vision. Um, but there are left insurrectionists as well. And insurrection doesn't have to be associated with racism or with sexism. The Occupy movement, uh, the 15M movement in Spain, these are left insurrectionist movements. And these are movements that are coming in and saying, maybe it doesn't matter so much whether the left is in power as long as the structures are still broken. As long as we still have government systems, corporate systems that aren't contributing to equality, that aren't making the world a more fair and just place. So don't assume that insurrection necessarily means right wing. It can be left wing as well. But it's a way of essentially saying, I want to change the institutions, not just work within the institutions. So why insurrectionism? Insurrectionism comes when people have a very high level of mistrust in the institutions in their lives. So in my country, the high point of trust in government was quite a while ago. It was around about 1964, about 10 years before I was born. 
And if you asked people, do you trust the government? If you asked them this in 1964, 77% of people would say yes. So basically four out of five. Since then, things have changed just a little bit. These days, if you ask the average American, do they trust the government, one out of five will tell you yes. So we went from four out of five to one out of five. This is a huge change. And it's a change in about 50 years. It's a whole change in how citizens see their relationship to their government. Part of what's crazy in the US is that people didn't just lose trust in government, they lost trust in all sorts of institutions. Anything that is big enough that you are dealing with a bureaucracy, you're dealing with a company, you're dealing with an organization, instead of dealing with one person, people have lost trust in it. So that includes the medical system. It includes banks and corporations and churches. It even includes universities, which is really disturbing for me as a university professor. And what's interesting is it's not just the United States. If you look at the United States, we are actually about a medium trust country. If you want to see places where people really don't trust things, go to Latin America, go to parts of Africa, that's where you see incredibly low levels of trust. One thing that's very interesting is that there's parts of Asia that have very high levels of trust. And this raises some questions about how people react to this. There's one way to read this that says, if a country is growing economically, if it's getting better, maybe people have very high trust in their government. There's another version of this that says, if the government suppresses freedom of speech, like they do in China, like they do in United Arab Emirates, maybe people aren't going to tell you an honest answer of whether they trust the government or not. And so one of the reasons I travel around the world talking about this is I want to know what you think. I actually hope that you will take some time to come talk with me about whether people in Taiwan trust institutions or not, and whether that's part of what's motivating what's going on. So remember, we're talking about institutionalists, people who work within institutions, insurrectionists, people who try to build new institutions or change them. But this doesn't always mean picking up a gun and going and trying to have revolution. Sometimes revolution can look very different. This is my friend Adam Foss. He's a really interesting guy. He grew up in Boston, the city that I work in, and he became a prosecutor, public prosecutor, criminal prosecutor. And he discovered that he was being asked to put a lot of black and brown men in prison. And he decided he didn't want to do it anymore. And so what he started doing instead is working with people and finding other ways to punish them rather than put them in prison. Maybe they would do community service. Maybe if they stole something, they would find a way to give it back. For a lot of people, maybe it was drug treatment or maybe it was more education or another way to keep people out of the prison system. And he realized over time that the problem was no one ever trained him as a prosecutor to do anything but put people in jail. So he only had one tool. And what he needed was a whole other set of tools. He needed all these other ways of trying to treat people who had committed crimes. What he does now is helps the city of Philadelphia train its prosecutors and train them not to put people in prison unless they really need to, unless they're really dangerous criminals, but to use the criminal justice system in an entirely different way. I call this radical institutionalism. This is someone who is within an institution. He is a prosecutor. He's within the DA's office. He's not changing any laws. He's just telling this office to change its outlook, to look in a different way, to get back to its fundamental purpose, which is the purpose of justice, not the purpose of imprisoning. When I think about insurrectionists, I think about radical institutionalists. I also think about people that I call counter-democrats. And what I mean by this is sometimes the best thing you can do is to stand outside of an institution 
and push really, really hard on it to try to make it change. And it might look that you're trying to push it over and knock it down, but sometimes what you're actually doing is pushing on it and making it stronger, making it more robust. I would argue that the press in a country can be a, a counter-democrat. I would argue that NGOs that work for transparency and try to make sure that corruption is not taking place. Maybe my favorite project in this is a project in Italy. It's called Monathon. We have a lot of people in this room who participate in hackathons, right? We have a lot of people who are programmers, who are very technical. But what do you do if you want to participate in a civic hackathon, but you can't hack? Well, one of the things you can do is monitor. My friend Luigi Reggi came up with this idea. He wanted people in Italy to go around in their cities and find projects that the EU was funding. And he wanted them to monitor them and to say, was this a good use of money? Was the money being spent well? Was corruption taking place? And so he organizes teams of high school students to go out and monitor every EU-funded project within their communities. This is something we could do anywhere in the world, but it requires us to think differently about what it means to be a citizen. That our job is not necessarily just to follow along and vote, Maybe our job is to be a critic from the outside, to take a hard look and to say, are people doing this right? And if they're not doing it right, to push very hard in the other direction. There's another form of insurrectionism that I celebrate, which I call disruption, disruptive innovation. We're used to this in the tech world. We used to all have phones on our desk, wireline phones. Then we had mobile phones. Now we have phones that use the internet for all of their telephony, whether it's WhatsApp or Skype or so ever. Each time we had disruptive change, we changed for something different. One of the reasons I got on an airplane to come over here is that I think GovZero is doing disruptive change within the government. It's looking at systems that weren't working very well and putting new systems in their place. And for me, v Taiwan, this process of doing consultation where there is someone in government as well as work online is one of the most exciting examples in the world today of how people are looking at a system and saying, Taiwan was not doing a very good job of listening to its citizens, let's do something entirely different. I think we could even imagine a future where we're going to have distributed institutions, where you might have something like BitNation, which wants to have people have virtual nations on the blockchain. And I think a lot of this is pretty silly, and I think most things that involve blockchain are pretty silly, but I'm seeing some projects that are not silly. Uh, there's a project in the United States called Civil, which is trying to figure out, could we fight fake news by having newsrooms where we have to register and agree to a constitution and a set of common values. And if we are moving away from our values, other people can vote and take us off of the system. And I actually think that's a very interesting alternative to using Facebook or another platform to distribute. How do we do this work? I look back to my friend Larry Lessig, and I look back to a book that probably some of you in this room have read, and it's an old book, but I want to try to make it new for you again. Lessig, in this book that he wrote in 1999, says that in society, there are four ways that we regulate behavior. We pass laws, and if you break those laws, you can be fined or you can be arrested. We use markets. We make some things cheap, we make them expensive. Most of you are on the Wi-Fi rather than on data. Wi-Fi is cheap. You know, data is expensive over your SIM card, right? We use code to make changes. We make new behaviors possible by writing technology and putting them out in the world. And we use norms. We use our social behavior. How do we treat each other? You saw this with Ipa at the beginning of the conference saying we have a norm here. We say hello, we greet each other, we introduce ourselves. That's another way to change society. I believe in turning Larry Lessig inside out. I think every one of these is potentially a force for change. 
And I think for those of us who want to be productive insurrectionists, we have to learn to turn these forces inside out. So the Trump administration is not going to do anything about climate change. They don't believe in it. But you're starting to see companies say, we're going to build electric cars. They're going to be sexier and cooler than anything else on the road. And in 10 years, it's going to be very unpopular to be driving a gasoline car. I don't think it will be a legal change. I think it will be a market change. I think it will simply make more sense to drive that car in a few years. You may remember my government has a bad habit of wanting to read your email. Even under the Obama administration, which was considerably less crazy than our current administration, we like to read your email. But you can make real change through code. I think Moxie Marlinspike has probably done more for privacy than any other person on the planet. And he did it by taking that encryption that's baked into Signal, the tool that a lot of us use for activism and for privacy, and got it included within WhatsApp, which means that there's a billion people around the world who have encryption that is protected from the NSA. We can make change through law, but we've got to think about how change in law and change in norms relate to one another. A couple of years ago, my country made one of the biggest achievements legally that it has in a while. It now recognizes equal marriage. My sister can get married to her partner who happens to be female, just like I could get married to my partner who also happens to be female. But this is a change that actually took a social change first. Let me explain. If you go back in history, America did something very brave in the 1960s when it said it's okay for people with black skin and white skin to get married. And when this decision was made, this was not very popular. When that court decision, Loving versus Virginia, was made, fewer than one out of five people would have told you that equal marriage was a good thing to do, and they would have supported it. It's very different right now with gay marriage. By the time the Supreme Court made this decision, more than 60% of people supported equal marriage. Our courts used to be very brave. They're not so brave anymore. And these days, if you want to make change through law, you have to make change first through social norms. You have to get people to understand how to change their minds and their hearts so that they support the legal change. And gay marriage had a lot to do with people getting used to seeing gay people and married gay people on television and having them become friends and heroes and people that they related to and connected to. And this is what we see right now in movements like Black Lives Matter. We don't need more laws to prevent police in my country from killing black people. That's been illegal for a long time. What we need is for people's minds and hearts to change. And that's what a movement like this is working on and working to change. I want to give one last thought to you as we think about how we become successful insurrectionists. And the thought is this. We can't require everyone to become Mahatma Gandhi. We have a real tendency to do this in the social change field. We want everyone to give of themselves completely. We want everyone to become as passionate, as psyched, as involved as we are. We want them to commit themselves body and soul to the cause. But if we want real movements that make change, that sustain themselves over time, we can't force everyone to be involved in such a thick way. We have to think about ways that are thin, but are also meaningful. At that same time as the US was campaigning for equal marriage, we saw this movement on Facebook of people changing their profile pictures to support equal marriage. And people said, this is silly. What does this do? What possible good is this? Well, I'll tell you, one thing that it does and does well is it signals that a social change is happening. It doesn't help you very much if only one person does it. It helps you a lot if 15 million people do it. 
and suddenly you realize that you are now the majority rather than the minority, that most people actually support this. And it's an activity that people were able to come in and put a part of themselves into. We're seeing this sort of movement right now, these movements that don't require you to become a professional activist, a full-time activist, but ask you to put a little bit of yourself in it around the Me Too movement, which is the movement against sexual harassment in the United States. There are people who are doing something as simple as saying, Me Too, I have also been sexually harassed. There are people who are putting a lot more of their lives and their hearts on the line by telling their stories and telling what happened to them. And as those stories come out, we are realizing the problems we have as a country and a culture, and that's the first step towards those norms-based changes. So I feel like I've given you too many choices here, right? You know, do we want people to be institutionalists and make change that way? Do we want them to be insurrectionists? Do, do we want to be building new work with inside institutions or outside or no institutions? Which of these levers do we use? How thin, how thick should our work be? I don't care. What I want is for people to choose what works for them. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing is what we call efficacy. It's this idea that we can, each one of us, whether we're somebody or nobody, can change the world. And our job is to figure out how we can push the world and make a positive change, and then to do the next step, which is to figure out how someone else can feel that ability to change the world and make a positive change. So I'm so grateful to be here in this room with so many people who are thinking about these questions and these issues. I hope some of these ideas might end up being inspiring or helpful as you talk about them. I have to say Gov Zero and the whole community has already been an enormous inspiration to me. It's just such a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. QA time. Um, any questions from Slido or you just sound out to the window like don't want to go. You ma. How? Omission I sent on. My name is. Can you hear me? My name is Sam Chang. I am the president of the Negative Vote Association based in Taiwan. We have a proposal, we believe, can improve all democracies in the world. If everybody look at the microphone on your table, you see when you vote, you have three choices. To approve or disapprove or neutral. Why don't we have these choices when we elect our leaders? We should have the option to vote no in a ballot. This is what we propose. Each voter still has only one vote. Thank you. I think it's a really interesting idea. I think when I talk about radical institutionalism, I'm talking about people hacking existing institutions. And one very interesting hack to voting would be to have that ability to vote no or vote neutral. I know of other people who are trying things like rank order voting uh, or preference voting and hoping that we're all going to find ourselves to elections that are significantly more free and fair. Certainly in my country, trying to figure out how we hack the election process and make it better is one of the things that people are working very hard on. That said, I want to warn everybody against silver bullets. Um, this idea that one change is suddenly going to change everything that's wrong with our systems. I think in many cases, we actually have to go back and examine the whole system, not just a component like the voting piece of it, and ask whether there are changes we can make. So I think it's wonderful to have ideas like this. I'm hugely supportive of people trying to propose these constructive hacks. 
I just think we need to put the context around them and understand that it's a piece of a larger change. Okay, another um, question on Slido. Do institutionalists and insur insurrectionists collaborate? Uh, I think institutionalists and insurrectionists absolutely can collaborate. Um, I teach journalism, and I think people who do hardcore investigative journalism look across the table at someone in government and say, look, on the one hand, my job is to hold you accountable and ask very hard questions. On the other hand, we're involved with the same process. <laughs> and we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't care about the same issues. So I think many of these forms of insurrectionism that I'm talking about require collaboration. Some of them look more angry and divided than others. If you are coming in and essentially saying, this government department doesn't work, I'm going to get rid of it and create an entirely different way for it to work, that might be a bit of an angry process, at least at first. Um, but I think at the end of the day, both institutionalists and insurrectionists are fighting against the same enemy, which is disengagement. What we're all fighting against are the people who don't bother participating anymore because they don't think they can have any influence or make any change. Okay, this is the summit. We have a lot of people who are not going to be able to do it. We have a lot of people who are not going to be able to do it. Now, the next How do you choose from the, those many options? I will tell you how to do it. How do you choose? So I think at the end of the day, you do the calculation within yourself and you figure out what you're passionate about and what you feel you can make change about. I, I take you back to my friend Luigi in Italy. He was passionate about hackathons, but he wasn't, you know, the people that he was trying to help weren't programmers. So he started looking for another way they could have that positive impact. If you're a programmer, maybe the way to make change is through code. It's something that you're better at doing than anyone else. But what I would say to you is challenge yourself. With those four tools, with, with norms, markets, code, and laws, it's easier to make change if you use all four of them together than if you use any one of them by yourself. And so the biggest thing is to form teams, is to form alliances. Find someone who understands the law. Find someone who's really good at journalism or social media who can work in the norms piece of it. Find someone who understands how to run a business so that you can make change financially sustainable. Maybe you do the code piece of it, but maybe you're part of a much larger team that's working together and trying to make the change. Yes. 刚刚就是他就是要协作协作协作跨界协作哦大家就是我们过去六年来在做的事情好那个中文的啊如何看待选举所造成的各种纷扰以及以及导致人与人之间的不信任好这是我们最后一题那I think right now we're seeing a lot of mistrust actually coming out of the political process. My country is going through a very difficult debate right now about our Supreme Court. I think people are going to end up mistrusting each other even more coming out of it. I think in many cases where we would benefit is for looking at issues where we actually can work together and accomplish a change rather than going after those most divisive problems. When I advise people to start getting involved with civics, it's rarely to work on something like a presidential campaign. It's often to work on an individual issue that they care about, sometimes at a local level, sometimes at a smaller level, so that they have a better chance of actually achieving a change from it. Change breeds change. When we have a success, as, as the GovZero movement has, you have more people who want to learn about it, who want to participate in it, who want to make the next change happen. 
But that first step is, is all about taking a step that you can actually achieve and then finding a way to build on it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Ethan. Um, Ethan, 会明天会有一场那个 unconference， 就是早上 unconference 在 R 三哦，这是 curated unconference， 就是有点有点。有点冲突的概念，但是就是他还有一场 side event 啊，明天早上在 R 三。那如果有兴趣的话，可以去看那个我们的共笔。好，那所以我刚才有看到问题，有问题想要再交流的话，你在现场可以抓他啊，然后明天参加活动。